Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. It is now 12.03. We're going to get started uh, with Medical Grand Rounds for today, January 21st. Um, we've got a really special and, and appropriate topic today, uh, Essentials and Palliative Care for COVID-19. Uh, my name is Chris Martin. I'm the Director of Medical Education and uh, very happy to have two of our uh, local experts in palliative care joining us for this talk today. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Jackie Lyon, Dr. Michelle Van Walraven in, in a moment. Um, just uh, in terms of the format for today, you'll see uh, this, the slideshow uh, on the screen. You'll hear Dr. Van Walraven and Dr. Lyon's voices uh, talk to the slides. Their presentation will take approximately 35 minutes uh, and then after that lots of times for answering questions. Now how we're going to do the questions is something called Slido. So if you want to open another window in your browser and just type in www.slido.com uh, you'll open up to a uh, screen that says it's basically a question and answer platform and at the top of the screen you'll see joining as a participant and a number sign and says enter code here uh, and in that uh, box you're going to put five one two three eight so again that's five one two three eight is the code uh, for that and at any point in the talk you can type in a question uh, and uh, um, uh, then at the end, we'll address the questions and get our experts uh, to answer that. Uh, I have a question already. I can't access the event by link season. I need permission. Uh, so I will let our producer, Amy Dempster, sort that out. And that's from Dr. Crawford. So let Amy, if, excuse me, is, uh, Amy's on it. Dr. Crawford, we'll get you on there. Uh, okay, so uh, that's for the, the questions. Uh, so, um, while everyone's getting that opened up, I'm going to introduce our two speakers for today. Um, I'll first like to introduce uh, Dr. Michelle Van Walraven. Uh, so Michelle uh, grew up here in Simcoe County and uh, was happy, and we were happy to have her return to Barrie, where she uh, graduated from the Family Medicine Teaching Unit in 2014. She practices community-based family medicine and palliative care at uh, Royal Victoria Hospital, as well as in the community. Uh, she's an avid and excellent teacher uh, and in family medicine and works as a lecturer and as a supervisor uh, at our family medicine teaching unit here in Barrie. Um, and this is through the University of Toronto's Department of Family and Community Medicine. Uh, she's the education lead for palliative care for postgraduate educa education here in Barrie. Outside of that busy clinical and uh, educational schedule, she likes spending time doing uh, many activities outside with skiing, swimming with her two children, Gavin and Bennett, husband Neil and dog, I'm going to say Kari, Kari, yeah. got it, okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, welcome Michelle and I'll introduce our second speaker. Uh, Dr. Jackie Lai, and uh, Jackie's a family physician, uh, again, practicing out of our family medicine teaching unit here at RVH, uh, and he's also part of the Oncology Symptom Management Clinic. Uh, he did his medical training at McMaster, and subsequently is family medicine resident here at RVH as well, homegrown as well. He's uh, currently completing a Master's of Science in Community Health at the University of Toronto, uh, although him and his wife are hopeful that finally they can say they're done going to school after this upcoming year. We'll see. You'll see your PhD, then you can say that, Jackie. Uh, finally, uh, immensely grateful the mentorship and opportunities that he's received through the medical community in Barrie, uh, particularly the staff at RVH and the FMTU. And uh, we are very grateful for both you uh, and Michelle, uh, who are contributing massively to our hospital, to our community, uh, and to this m hugely important area of palliative care, uh, which you know I think is um, underrepresented and underappreciated across the board. And no more uh, is it important in this current pandemic. And so uh, your topic of uh, palliative care in the COVID-19 pandemic is, is exceptionally topical. And again, uh, looking forward to it. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Van Walraven. You can get started. Thanks, Chris. So thank you everyone for attending this session today. These are challenging times, but I'm happy that you're here or listening in um, as you want to learn more about palliative care, especially in the situation of COVID-19. We're all coming with different experiences in palliative care, and we hope that we can recognize that palliative care with patients with COVID-19 and their families um, has a distinct role and are quite significant because of the acute and uncertain nature of their illness. So 
Uh, today, we have nothing to declare or we're not affiliated with anything uh, in particular except um, our own memberships with um, different associations from across Canada. Uh, and as well, we're happy to have Jackie Lai as our uh, palliative care clinical co-lead for the North Simcoe Muskoka Palliative Care Network. So again, as I said today, we hope to review with you the significance of palliative care medicine and end-of-life basics. Uh, we want you to be able to become familiar with advanced care planning and be more comfortable with having these goals of care discussion, especially for patients and their families with COVID-19. Be able to manage some of the symptoms of COVID-19 and be comfortable with some basic end-of-life care symptom management and uh, identify um, a palliative care approach. So when I talk about a palliative care approach, um, this is, um, again, um, it's palliative care is synonymous with hospice care or end of life care. But what we're talking about is an approach to their care for a patient facing a life threatening illness or disease. And of course, um, those who are choosing comfort and a focus on comfort, um, we want to, uh, deliver palliative care to someone with COVID-19 in a very um, efficient and effective way. Um, as you know, there are many sequelae that come from having COVID-19, of course, death being one of them, but many of these patients experience really prolonged restlessness and respiratory distress. And of course, we want to be able to ease their suffering um, and, and help both the patient and their family during this time. So the vision is to help patients live as they choose and to optimize their quality of life, allowing them to have comfort and dignity and security at the end of their life. We know, of course, there is a rapid decline sometimes in these cases, and we want families and patients to be aware. What I'm hoping uh, to establish here at RVH and in our community is that most practitioners and most um, healthcare workers will be comfortable with basic level or primary level palliative care. So the way to look at it is the bottom of the triangle are all of our primary level palliative care people. And this can include specialists, this can include nurses, pharmacists, spiritual care, and I'd like to think of this team being able to execute basic level primary care for someone with COVID-19. As you go up in the model, you encounter more complex patients where the patient needs more specialized palliative care teams with more skills. And this is where we will get involved. We're gonna start with some advanced care planning discussion and how to go about this. Perfect, thanks, Michelle. So yeah, in establishing some primary level palliative care skills, uh, one of the fundamental uh, skills that we really wanna work on is advanced care planning. Um, I think it's a skill that all team members should consider practicing and becoming more comfortable with discussing a patient's advanced care plan. Uh, especially in the context of COVID-19, uh, we encourage the team to discuss a patient's goals of care at the initial assessment and admission to hospital. What we've learned is that patients with a suspected or diagnosed COVID-19 um, diagnosis may have a rapid decline in condition several days into their diagnosis, uh, really resulting in a pretty bad respiratory distress or confusion if that happens. We know it's easier to have a conversation about goals when things are more calm than in a time of crisis. So for example, uh, it may be helpful to start a conversation by asking if things were to get worse, what would be important to you for your care? Next slide. There will also be times when patients are unable to express or make decisions for themselves. Um, and when this happens, it's important to understand who would be making the decisions on the patient's behalf. The de default in Canada is that the patient substitute decision maker um, makes these decisions and it follows this hierarchy, uh, as you can see here on the slide. Um, that's that green region that we 
commonly default to as the SDM. The power of attorney for personal care uh, is someone that the patient has chosen and is legally higher in the hierarchy than the default SDM. So oftentimes we also ask uh, who someone's power of attorney of care is if they've already appointed someone. Next slide. Whether we're having a goals of care discussion with our patients or their family members, um, it's important to have a structured approach to the conversation because it can be tough and difficult for both ourselves as well as who we're talking to. I often find it helpful to ask for permission in initiating the conversation as it invites and prepares the patient. I also find it helpful to gauge patient and family understanding of their illness and the expectations by asking them, you know, what has been shared with you about this illness and what is your understanding of what you could expect? Next slide. And in continuing the goals of care discussion, I really like this next technique that I'm gonna share. It's called the wish, worry, wonder. It's a technique that's easy to learn and I do encourage everyone to try practicing this, um, whether at home or uh, with a colleague. Um, an example is COVID-19 is a viral illness that we know can be particularly serious in patients like yourself. I wish we were in, we, I wish we were not in this situation and I'm worried that you could get much sicker very quickly. If this happened, you're at a high risk of dying from this illness. I wonder if we could talk about what you would want and what you would not want in your care if your condition worsens. I'll give some time for everyone to read some of these other tough questions that we have on the slide. Um, these are things that we may ask patients. The answers may ultimately be helpful in finding out information that's important and meaningful to our patients. Saying these out loud and practicing them at home may be helpful. Uh, and I find that the more I speak about them and talk about them and ask these questions myself, I become more comfortable with asking these hard questions to patients. So we'll just stay on this slide for people to read. Jackie, I also just want to point out that these questions give us more information than just asking a patient what their code status is or whether they want to be resuscitated. Uh, Patients don't appreciate those terms and what that means, but these types of questions are much more valuable in getting the right information that we need as a medical provider. Absolutely. And then after asking those tough questions and having that conversation with patients, I like to close the conversation and sometimes I find it helpful to summarize what the patient and family members have shared with us. I think it gives opportunity to recommend treatments and interventions that are truly based on what we know about this patient's values and goals. So for example, we can say, I've heard you say it's important for you that your breathing is comfortable and that we do not want to prolong any suffering. Keeping in mind what we know can occur with this illness, I recommend that we focus our energy and effort in treating your symptoms. If things worsen, I would not recommend us going into the ICU or be put on a ventilator as that may prolong suffering. So I just want to point out that um, we have developed a PPO for end of life care for an adult patient with or with uh, suspected COVID-19. We also have a toolkit that's posted on SharePoint that you can access through SharePoint, um, clicking, um, sorry, I can't highlight where, but clicking on the SharePoint, then clicking on COVID-19 information, then accessing files and resources, and finally accessing the palliative care toolkit. I would encourage um, all practitioners who are caring for someone with COVID-19 at the end of life to utilize the PPO um, as it does give a lot of good direction 
as well, the toolkit has some of these resources, including a one pager for symptom management uh, for someone with COVID-19 at the end of life. So I would uh, encourage you to access those resources. Uh, here it is, here's the one pager um, that you can find easily online through Ontario Palliative Care Network or in the SharePoint. Some things to consider when caring for someone at the end of life. Uh, in, in, in most basic palliative care medicine, we start to discontinue medications that are not there for comfort. This would include um, um, antiplatelet agents, diuretics, statins, um, things that are, again, not uh, there for comfort. Sometimes, for example, insulin for an insulin dependent diabetic may be helpful to keep on as we don't want them to get uncomfortable in going into early DKA. Focus on choosing a parental route because sometimes you lose the ability to swallow. So keeping those IVs for rapid access uh, is important, but maybe consider discontinuing hydration because we know that hydration doesn't prolong uh, or, or, or can sometimes worsen someone's symptoms, especially if they feel like they're drowning. Remember that COVID-19 symptoms do escalate quickly, and so be prepared to escalate these dosages. Sometimes, you know, check, again, checking in with nursing or you as a nurse, knowing that you've given more than three PRN doses, maybe consider regularly scheduling these doses rather than just making it PRN. I'd like to also encourage you to not waste some of these medications. While we do have plenty supply, my understanding is as of now, um, we would not want to go into a situation where we are, um, um, of course, in a deficit. So it's important to stockpile some of these essential medications, which I know is done, is done right now through pharmacy and is being done in the community. Um, in many cases, when someone truly is at the end of life, we do stop monitoring, monitoring vitals. Again, the focus is not on numbers. The focus is looking at the patient and assessing them for their comfort level. Um, as you know, bundling care is important for, for uh, limiting um, contact. Uh, discontinuing different tubes, again, that are not essential for comfort and considering discontinuing any other investigations. I do want to emphasize the second last point about the importance of providing spiritual care and comfort care uh, and, and social work uh, accessible here at RVH for someone and their family um, members who are passing away from COVID-19. I think we know that the grief and the bereavement part of COVID-19 hasn't been explored as much yet, but we know that it's quite significant. We know that most people at the end of their life want to talk about their spirituality and can, um, we can alleviate a lot of suffering by just talking to them and, and having this connection. So if we have some virtual ways of doing this, um, I think it's really important that we are trying to do this for patients as they're very isolated for, for prolonged periods of time from their family. We're going to talk a bit about symptom management in particular. So first of all, airway secretions. We know that these patients have um, excessive airway secretions at times. Our usual first line of choice is using scopolamine 0.4 to 0.6 milligrams subcut or IV every four hours as needed. And this can sometimes be helpful because it does make them a little bit more sedated and, and maybe that is part of their goal is to just be comfortable and sedated. We have glycopyrrolate as a backup um, if, if you would want to use that. Um, we also use some furosemide. It's been recommended to use them for someone who has a lot of lower airway fluids or secretions, and that can be given 20 milligrams subcut um, every two to four hours. Just remember they might need an, uh, a Foley if you're going to be um, diuresing them. Finally, I see this a lot in positioning of patients who are having airway secretions. Someone who's conscious is usually sitting up um, which is helpful, but for someone who's unconscious, it's actually more helpful to have their head down and their head turned to the side with their feet elevated above their head. This actually helps drain the fluid from their lungs um, and can make it um, uh, a lot less noisy um, and, and uh, more comfortable for the patient. But I want to remind you again that for someone who's unconscious, 
the secretions and the noises that you hear are not usually uncomfortable for the patient. It's more for us. And so again, just keep in mind you're treating um, symptoms. So if the patient looks comfortable, um, then you don't need to do much more than that. Moving on to another common symptom that we are probably going to encounter, especially in patients dying of COVID-19, uh, is dyspnea or rest, uh, breathlessness. Uh, opiates are uh, typically our primary first-line therapy for managing the symptom, um, even if the patient has underlying uh, lung disease uh, and we're concerned about uh, thoughts about uh, respiratory depression, which does occur. Uh, and although they can reduce uh, respiratory drive uh, when used in appropriate doses and monitored, uh, they could be helpful in reducing the sensation of dyspnea and breathlessness, reduce anxiety, suppress cough, and really reduce the work of breathing. This allows patients to take calmer and deeper breaths as well. I generally like to start either morphine or hydromorphone uh, subcutaneously or IV uh, at these starting doses, which are quite low. And these could be up titrated as needed. It's always safest to start opiates at a low dose and titrate up when we need. And also keep into uh, account if the patient was previously on opiates, then you may need to adjust those uh, doses based off of, the, of their previous dose. If we're finding that we're needing quite a few PRN doses, like Michelle had, um, Dr. Van Wall Raven had uh, previously mentioned then it would be important to consider uh, some routine scheduled dosing along with the PRN doses so that we don't get behind on the symptoms as these drugs wear off. Next slide. In some cases, we may encounter severe dyspnea and these even high doses of opiates may not settle. Uh, in these situations, we might need to use something like midazolam to help relieve the discomfort. This could be given as either boluses to help sedate and manage the severe dyspnea or routinely, but ultimately midazolam can also wear off quite quickly. So there may need to be a consideration of continuous infusion. This specific technique of continuous infusion of the sedating agent is called continuous palliative sedation therapy. And if we're considering this, I would recommend consulting with um, a palliative care on-call service or our on-call service to help with this procedure. Uh, there are some details of this procedure that um, I think we can help support. It's important to be very clear with the expectations of this procedure uh, as patients will be sedated. And um, using this procedure does require gathering consent from the patient or their substitute decision maker. Pain in the context of palliative care is also managed well with opiates. Um, we follow the same principles of starting at a low dose and titrating up as needed. Switching between opiates can be done safely by looking at equivalency charts and conversion tables. Uh, it's not uncommon for patients to come in with something like Tylenol number threes or oxycodones um, and need to be switched over to something like morphine or hydromorphone, which can be given either IV or sub-Q. One thing to always be mindful of is that the subcutaneous and IV doses are uh, twice as strong as their PO counterparts or oral counterparts. Uh, for example, one milligram of hydromorphone subcutaneous is equivalent to the strength of two milligrams hydromorphone oral. So the written dose of subcutaneous doses is therefore half of the dose of um, what we would put down for the oral dose to get the same effect. Lastly, when using opiates, um, remember there can be unwanted side effects of constipation and nausea, as well as other um, rare side effects. Uh, it may be helpful to have some bowel medications and antiemetics uh, ordered preemptively. So just some other um, symptom management points that might come up. Um, someone who's feeling nauseous or having some vomiting, our medications of choice to go to are haloperidol, uh, 4.5 to 1 milligram, subcut every four hours. We also use metoclopramide, 
five to 10 PO or IV every six hours. Again, these are uh, our choice because they can be given by a parental route. Uh, fever management is usually done through acetaminophen, PO or PR. But again, I find at the end of life when we're not measuring temperature, we're again just focusing on comfort. The symptom that I, th I think has come up uh, is cough in these patients. Opioids are helpful for managing cough as they suppress the cough uh, reflux. Um, using hydrocodone can be helpful, helpful and dexamethorpan 10 to 20 milligrams PO can be helpful for cough suppression. Correct with this and go ahead, Jack. Sorry. Oh, restlessness and delirium may also be encountered with COVID-19 infections um, and really ending end of life, uh, especially in the older populations. Um, there are a few pharmacological options that we can use on top of our usual conservative strategies. Uh, so to try to orient the patient and try to limit the amount of noise and um, uncomfortable uh, environmental um, stimulants. If we're quite restless, I tend to use uh, and start with Haldol 0.5 to 1 milligram, uh, subcutaneous or IV every two hours as needed as a starting dose, and this can certainly be, be, be up titrated as needed. Combining this with lorazepam in the context of COVID-19 uh, can sometimes be helpful as anxiety and breathlessness can be a precipitant to restlessness and delirium. So lorazepams and benzodiazepines can help with that anxiety and breathlessness as well. If we're still continuing to find that the restlessness and agitation delirium continues uh, and it's hard to control despite higher doses, then we can consider the use of methotripemeprosine uh, or commonly known as nosinan. This can be quite effective in helping with symptoms of uh, agitation, um, but before starting this, uh, I do think it's prudent to make sure that the goals are quite clear with family members as this is a really sedating medication and really generally used only in the setting of end of life care. So finally, again, um, when to consult our team or what can we do as palliative care specialists at our VH and in our community. Um, again, we're a very helpful resource for some of these symptoms if you're having trouble managing them. Um, we do help with discussions around difficult goals of care or advanced care planning. We also help um, with coordinating home care. So, so for a patient who's in hospital and wants to go home or a patient who wants to go to hospice, we're able to organize that. Uh, and of course, for some of those complex patients, um, we uh, can be helpful um, to even just give a palliative lens. You know, consulting us is not a sign of failure that you're not doing the right thing, um, but can just offer a bit of a palliative approach to what's going on right now. Um, of course, we are available 24 hours a day at RVH for RVH inpatients. We are not in-house, but available by phone. So we're happy to take a phone call and talk with you over the phone to troubleshoot some of these difficult situations or point you in the right direction. As I pointed out, we uh, are trying to make some of these resources accessible to you. Um, and uh, if you want to learn more, there are uh, webinars and modules available on some of these websites. Um, to, to better um, improve your uh, skill set or your toolkit, as we call it. I really just want to thank you for tuning in um, and just remember to be compassionate to yourself and to others and uh, that grief is a process and uh, please um, take some time for yourself and be empathetic to others. So thank you for tuning in and we do have lots of time for questions that we can answer now or of course you can call us or email us later. Wonderful, uh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle and Jackie. I know that uh, if everyone was in the room, there'd be tons of clapping right now. I'm sure everyone's clapping at home right now. That was awesome. Um, we're just gonna open up the question boards to Slido. So if people have questions, again, go on www.slido.com uh, and uh, type in your question and I will uh, pose it to our speakers. 
Um, I've got one while we're waiting. Uh, it's kind of it's a two part question. The first one is how I mean I think that obviously COVID is a disease is uh, you presented a great overview of the challenges with the cough and the breathlessness. How has it been a having the discussions with some of these patients and more importantly with their families of patients who maybe not be able to consent when they're not able to actually visit? So you're doing these difficult conversations on the phone versus in person. Uh, that's the first part of my question, so I'll, I'll let one of you two tackle that. Thanks, Chris. I, I can. Oh, go oh, ahead. Sorry, Doctor. <laughs> sure, I can uh, tackle that. Um, so you're correct, Doctor Martin. It's it's certainly much more challenging now to have these difficult conversations. Um, with both patients and family members. Um, and that's why we generally feel that it's been more effective to have these conversations early um, to set the stage uh, rather than when the symptoms um, or condition escalates. Um, having these conversations on the phone aren't easy. Uh, a lot of the nonverbal communication and cues are what we use often as humans to see how people are feeling and responding to these questions. So it is a challenge. Uh, I think using some of the techniques that um, we shared today and practicing them um, and giving time and space pauses in between these questions uh, are, are, are ways that I found it to be helpful um, both for patients and especially for family members to, to appreciate what we are saying. So I would say that despite the challenges uh, of doing these over the phone, it's better to do them rather than not do them. Um, so definitely something that we continue to work on and develop skill in doing, but the reality of where we are right now it's something that we have to work with. And uh, the, so Jackie, would you recommend trying to do it on video because of those kind of physical cues, if possible, if you had a, if you can take the time to set up a, a, like a, a Teams call with the family member? For sure. Family meetings are very, very helpful. Uh, and if that could be done over video, um, you get to gauge the room get to see who your partners are, who we're working with uh, over this uh, family meeting. Yeah, and I found it uh, even you know, having the family be able to see the patient because if they've been in hospital for a while and not been able to visit, they may look quite a bit different than what they remember them in their mind as in terms of helping them make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, now, Michelle, a question for you, or do you want to add anything to that question? Do you have a, a follow-up yeah, question? Yeah, I mean, again, I would just... Um, re-emphasize what we what we discussed in the presentation really the important tools are to set up the conversation you know properly as we just said you know, address their understanding of what's going on right now and share their prognosis and, and uncertainty um, and explore these topics so the same the same approach goes for any patient with um, an, a life-threatening illness um, and as Jackie said, I think it's just important to practice that approach and it becomes more comfortable whether doing it in person or on the phone um, to, to be able to get to those, those important conversations. Awesome. And, and my next question is for uh, obviously the visiting restrictions have been a challenge for, uh, you know, around the times of patients, you know, uh, if they are, especially if they're being palliative and uh, palliated. Um, how do you tackle that? Because obviously it's different in the ICU in my world where when people are palliated, it happens fairly quickly. But if it happens over days, how do we tackle the challenges of the visiting restrictions we have and the importance of having the family uh, at the bedside during the patient's last days? Go ahead, Jackie. Sorry, uh, Dr. Martin, can you repeat that once? Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, no, sorry, I thought, Jackie, you had something to say. No, Chris, um, <laughs> Chris, the, it is very challenging. You're right. And so, um, and especially as our restrictions get greater and greater um, um, during these times. So 
So again, I think I think to my understanding is we are making some exceptions, but in general, um, we have to use virtual visits with family members, especially, you know, these family members are, are likely infected with COVID-19 themselves and um, they can't leave the house. And so we have to utilize the technology and the communication um, and it's time consuming, you're right, to have to, to call and set these things up, but it's really important uh, for the grief and the bereavement of the family who's going to be dealing with this afterwards to be able to have seen or talked to their loved one near the end of their life, if that's important to them. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Michelle. And, and I know with one of ours patients, unfortunately passed away in the ICU, we basically left the, the iPad running and so the family could be present from all over Toronto so they could be, you know, see their loved one uh, during her last um, uh, hours. Um, thanks. Uh, I got a question from a, an, R, an RVH legend, Dr. Dave Bushi uh, here. What's the highest rate uh, dose, I'm assuming, of dilated sub-Q you've used uh, in COVID patients, especially with those with history of narcotic use? Okay, so um, to be honest, um, I haven't encountered using dilaudid for pain very often in these patients, but, um, and maybe Jackie, you can speak up as well after, but um, usually Dave, when we get to a high dose of dilaudid, especially that need requires more regular dosing, we go to a CAD pump and that way the CAD pump can deliver the medication at routine intervals that we set and maintain a um, good baseline pain control and it can be titrated up fairly quickly. Um, in my experience with, say, non-COVID patients, some who have a history of opioid use or are not, uh, by all means, um, um, opioid naive, sometimes I've had to go as high as five milligrams of dilaudid an hour, and that's by subcut. So, um, again, it depends on that goal uh, of care discussion with the patient and their family. Um, and of course, I'd say if we're going up that high and using CAD pumps, that again is where our team is helpful for um, navigating you through what is acceptable and watching for opioid toxicity. Thanks, Michelle. Awesome. I'll add to that. I know it's not a competition, but I've gone up to nine milligrams per hour of hydromorphone subcut before in a patient uh, in the community. Uh, and this is someone that did have severe COPD because of a condition called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, and they did quite well with their respiratory status and symptom control, uh, despite these high doses. Um, one thing to be mindful of is if someone was opiate naive or they were really on just low doses of Dilaudid um, to begin with, and they had really rapidly escalating symptoms, um, I know that we said we can up titrate the medications, um, but oftentimes um, one point that's hard is that if we are needing really, really rapid up titration, a lot of people don't do well with rapid up titration of, um, of opiates um, because they can get quite delirious and uh, a, a phenomenon called neural toxicity. So if we're finding that we're not really getting great control um, and we're trying to increase these doses of opiates to control their breathlessness, then it may be worth it to consider some other agents like benzodiazepines in, in combination to help with controlling these symptoms of breathlessness. Great, okay, thanks very much. Um, I just wanna really quickly go back to our uh, visitation. It, it, the IPAC team is a great resource for any questions around visit, uh, visiting around times of kind of compassionate reasons, uh, especially if some of the family members, which is unusual, also have COVID or had recent COVID themselves. So don't be afraid to contact IPAC and the HSLs to help coordinate those visits. Um, another question here for uh, from on the board, how can we improve access to palliative care in times of COVID-19? And this may be in a community or in hospital. So, so one of my one of my points is really primary level palliative care can be delivered by anyone, right? Um, palliative basic or primary level palliative care can be delivered by family physicians throughout all of our community, and, and many of us do in in Barrie and Simcoe area. Um, 
accessing um, in RVH, of course, is through either a doctor to doctor consult to consult us at the palliative care team, um, or can be done through the North Simcoe Muskoka Palliative Care Network. So you can, uh, we do have our palliative care network in the region with some uh, very knowledgeable resource nurses who can offer support to both the physician and the family. Um, and that can be put in as an order both at RVH or can be accessed from the community. We also have a fantastic community palliative care team um, that's led by Dr. Clark. Um, and um, they will offer palliative care in Simcoe region for home-based patients. Uh, and of course, our hospice Simcoe is another great resource for uh, accessing any information. I think really the point is just to recognize when you are crossing over to a palliative care approach and keeping that lens on. Uh, the lens that you are offering comfort, you are not curing someone, you are, uh, goal is to alleviate the suffering. And uh, again, that can be done not just through physicians, but through many other practitioners and members of their care team. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Uh, another question here for uh, either your uh, view is, uh, what can we do to help educate the public on the specific challenges that all of us, patients, families, and clinicians are facing? And I, I'm assuming they're mean kind of palliative care in the, in the context of COVID. So how can we educate the public on, on that? Okay, so I think um, it starts, uh, I mean, it starts with all of us. It starts with, um, the hospital, um, promoting the importance of having these discussions with your family. It starts with your family doctor initiating some of these conversations with your family. Um, there are some really good resources out there. Um, Speak Up, uh, Speak Up Ontario will offer booklets to sit down with the family that they can do themselves to, to, to have these discussions. Um, Pallium Canada and also um, BC, um, um, Pallium in BC have lots of videos that are based uh, and geared towards patients um, in order to promote having these discussions beforehand. I think as you're hearing, uh, you know, the most important thing is to be prepared, right? And I know our long-term care homes are having these discussions with, with or I know physicians in the long-term care homes are having these discussions with all of their patients. But we in the community should be addressing this with our frail patients or with our at-risk patients, which there are a lot of them. Um, and uh, I think it just it starts with, uh, again, normalizing it in this context that it's important to have these types of discussions now um, so everybody knows what to do. All right, great. Uh, really interesting question here, which uh, I think we'll have a bunch of answers for. Uh, have you had any personal experience in palliative sedation in COVID patients? And do people choose ventilation due to exhaustion? I have uh, not, Jackie, or maybe Chris, you, you might be better at answering some of this too. Yeah, I was going to say Dr. Martin probably has the most experience. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, so I think that I'm going to I'm going to tackle the the you know the we have had we've done palliative sedation on many COVID patients, and I think that the ventilation question is a great question. And this is in palliative care all the time. It's if someone's being palliative, how much oxygen do you give them? Like you know do you you know and that's a, a question uh, that we ask all the time. Like do you limit the oxygen? You know if they're breathless until you get their symptoms under control, do you titrate up the oxygen? And there's we get asked all the time. Oh, can you bring this person down to the ICU because they'd be less breathless if you put them on BiPAP? or if you put them on a ventilator and and that potentially is true however when we when we talk about offering ventilation or non-invasive ventilation like bipap or cpap we have to offer a treatment that's going to offer them benefit and so as part of their care plan before we'd even discuss that we would have a discussion okay would non-invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation uh, aid you in recovering to a quality of life that you would find access uh, acceptable and if the answer is no, then that's not offered as part of their care plan. And so we wouldn't put someone on on non-invasive or, or invasive ventilation uh, because it would make them quote unquote more comfortable. I think we would get 
an early palliative care consult from our, our colleagues and make sure they're on the right medication. And with the right medication, the right dosing, with the right people doing it, um, you shouldn't have anyone to a point where they're like, oh, give me that BiPAP because I'm you know really struggling here. Um, and so that, that would be the, the answer to that question. Um, and you know, I think that uh, again, with with just using some of the techniques that that Dr. La, uh, Lai and Dr. Van Wolven have described, we've you know I think successfully made sure that when unfortunately our palliative care pa or our COVID patients who you know. Uh, whose care plan did not include ventilation. They did not want a non-invasive ventilation or uh, or invasive ventilation. Uh, with the techniques that they've just described to you, uh, we provide a very good palliative care and these patients are very comfortable. We don't accelerate the process. We just make sure they're very comfortable throughout there. Uh, and you know, we've done all the other important things to try to make it as peaceful and as dignified for them as, as possible. Anything you guys want to add to that? No, thank you, Chris. And, and I think, um we are going to be having these conversations more often now um and i, I do think um, um there may can be a team approach to this if you ever need uh one of us to be part of that team to have these types of conversations with patients okay uh, thanks so much michelle another question here is there any resources we could share with patient families after a patient passed away to assist with griefs and next steps? Matt Moss. And that's a really good question because I, I find that sometimes that's a, we do lack a piece uh, that sometimes, and I know that's a hole sometimes with some care that we like, the patient passed away, they're like, what do we do now? And then uh, the nurses are excellent at it, but we as physicians, I think at least the non-palliative care physicians are often a little bit like, uh, okay, I think there's a package for you. W what do you guys recommend? I could take this one. Um, so there's lots of resources, unfortunately, for our patients and their family members, um, even before they pass away. Um, so lots and lots of resources that we have uh, provincially, uh, lots of resources that we have uh, also locally. Um, I know that Dr. Van Raven spoke about consulting spiritual care and social work. Um, so these are for patients that are in hospital already. Uh, they really can benefit from an early referral to social workers and um, spiritual care. Um, but for, say, Dr. Moss in the emergency department, uh, if you do want to refer someone to um, a local resource, um, our local hospice, Hospice Simcoe, has a community team that helps with grief counseling uh, as well as grief groups. Um, that's a great resource. They're well staffed. Uh, they're very trained and very experienced. Uh, and they would love to touch uh, people in our community to help them through a difficult process. Um, family members can also go on a website that's uh, Canadian nationally run called mygrief.ca. Um, it's run by an organization called Canadian Virtual Hospice, uh, and they have lots of modules, videos, um, information. So um, we could certainly put that on the slide do, uh, but it's uh, spelled mygrief.ca. Thanks very much. Sorry, go ahead, Michelle, you want to add something? And, um, in Barrie, we also have the Season Center for Grieving, and this is for children, um, particularly under the age of 18, who have lost a loved one, um, and that can be accessed uh, for all children as well. So that's the Seasons Grieving Center. Those are, uh, yeah, if we, maybe we'll post those up when we post the video. Uh, those are good resources. I, I would like to give a shout out uh, to our social workers and our spiritual care at the hospital. They are amazing. And so uh, as Jackie and, and Michelle said, do not hesitate to call them. They are wonderful resources, uh, so comforting for the families uh, in, in all these situations. So please reach out to them because they're, they're incredible. Uh, okay, next question. Palliative care teams, how can they be best utilized in the eMERGE department? Should someone be embedded physically or via telehealth, given that many of these patients come through the care of the eMERGE in all parts of their journey? Um, that's a very interesting question. And um, it, I mean, traditionally we've been available by phone, as I said, 24 hours a day to offer some support or suggestions. Um, you know, we occasionally when we're on call, we, we do go into the eMERGE if necessary. As for embedding someone permanently, that's an interesting concept that actually has come up from the GTA hospitals. Um, you know, it, are we at the point where we should actually have um, a dedicated palliative team in our emergency room? And I think we're willing to open that up for discussion. 
um, you know, times are changing and we need to change fast too. Um, so uh, I think that's that's another um, good resource that we could try to try to work in. And I guess the, to that uh, follow up on that. So if someone's in the eMERGE who I think may benefit from palliative care, how was it including your slide of how's the best referment into the community to the palliative care team if they're not already involved? Let's say I, I find the oncology patients are often linked in, but some of the non-oncologic diagnosis, cirrhosis, uh, COPD, congestive heart failure, uh, don't uh, sometimes don't have those links. How the how's the best way to set that up as an outpatient? So. Um, there's uh, two resources I'll talk about. One of them is the North Simcoe Muskoka Palliative Care Network. So there is a referral um, page usually, uh, I think it's on online, um, on their website. It's accessible uh, on many floors of the hospital. So the North Simcoe Muskoka Palliative Care Network has two purposes. One is for educating families and um, and the second is for finding a palliative care physician in the community to care for a patient. So if you encounter a patient in the eMERGE or even on service, that is going home and you think, eh, you know, we need to have more more discussions around this with the family or more um, um, maybe specialized care that maybe is not being provided by their by their physician right now. You can always just submit a referral. It's a one page referral to the palliative care network and um, and check off what you're looking for. Um, the second resource is Hospice Simcoe again. So Hospice Simcoe has an outpatient palliative care clinic. Um, so again, this is run by some of our fabulous community-based palliative care physicians who do care for pe people in Simcoe County, and you can refer them to the Hospice Simcoe Clinic, and this is for any diagnosis. Um, you know, again, a lot of the time, the oncology patients have great access through the cancer centre, but for non-oncological patients, this is another great resource to access a palliative care physician, either just for a consult or to take over their care. So again, in the eMERGE, um, you can um, send them, uh, send those two referrals off uh, to the palliative care network and to Hospice Simcoe, or call us and we can direct you how to do that or where to find that information um, and, and go from there. One thing I wanted to note for that is uh, in follow up, Dr. Martin, if um, you have a patient that you're discharging from the eMERGE, but um, you truly think that they're frail, their their disease is at an end stage um, condition. A lot of our patients have excellent family physicians in our community, and a lot of our family doctors uh, are very skilled in providing those goals of care discussions that primary level palliative care and supporting them uh, either in their clinic or even during home visits. Uh, we're, we're fortunate enough in our community that we have really uh, family doctors that have been trained uh, to provide comprehensive uh, family medicine. Um, and sometimes they just need the permission to say, hey, look, um, the eMERGE was really concerned about you. Uh, I, I now have permission to follow up. Um, so uh, I would encourage eMERGE docs if you um, feel like the patient needs that follow-up from a palliative lens, um, perhaps uh, maybe sending a quick note, giving a quick call or a message to the family doctor's office and saying, patient was quite sick, um, would benefit from a palliative approach to care. Uh, that initiates that process for us, and that's often very helpful. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jackie and Michelle. Um, so that's, I don't have any other questions on the, on the board here. So, and it's at uh, 12.56, so perfect time. Uh, done, everyone likes to be done a little early. Uh, I'd like to thank both of you. That was a wonderful, informative presentation. Uh, and uh, I'm sure the viewers that were watching uh, learned a ton. I learned a ton. And I wanna thank you guys for your expertise, your compassion. Uh, we're very lucky to have you in the hospital and in our community. Uh, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing how, how you'll take our palliative care uh, even further in the future. Um, so for those people who didn't get to, uh, to watch it today, it will be shared. Uh, and then we're going to send out a link for people who want to watch it later. So if your colleagues didn't have a chance to log in, uh, uh, Jessica Calderon from the uh, Medical Affairs will send out a link later. Uh, but again, I'd like to thank uh, Jackie, uh, Michelle, uh, Amy Dempster and Jessica uh, for setting this up. Uh, great talk and thanks again, everyone.